On the agenda tonight, we're going back to the early 70s. We're going to be taking a look at Helen Reddy, and she's going to be performing I Don't Know How to Love Him. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. First of all, thank you everyone for the messages requesting this video tonight following the sad news that Helen passed away at the end of last month. We are going to watch this the whole way through. We'll then get into the analysis and we'll also cover her history and career at the end of the video as well. So let's get Helen up on screen and see how she gets on. have it. This performance and this song is where it all started for Helen because this is originally from the Jesus Christ Superstar musical written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice and it is so demanding from a pitch perspective vocally and this is the thing about Helen when she's performing it you don't take that in at all because of the ease with which she's hitting these notes and her accuracy pitch wise is so impressive throughout this whole performance and in everything that she sang because she didn't have that 
dramatic vibrato, which sometimes in musical theatre and especially in opera, and it depends how you want to classify Jesus Christ Superstar as a rock opera or a musical, but having this delivery that is usually a little bit theatrical because of the nature of what's being performed on stage, Helen didn't have a wide vibrato. She didn't have a wide pitch being covered, so it meant that she had to hit the notes right between the eyes and then you can hear a tiny bit of vibrato within the note, but she's not changing the pitch of that note dramatically. So it meant that if she wasn't dead on the whole time, it would start to grate. It would be so obvious because of her stylization, the way that she sang. But here you get such an appreciation of the way that she hits that C5 in the verse. Another thing to mention about this composition are these random, seemingly random jumps. Of course, they're not. They're all in key. They're all on pitch. But vocally approaching this, jumping up to a C5 in the verse, it's something that you're not expecting. This is something that happens all the time in musical theater and opera. The people who are writing the compositions aren't singers. They're not writing this with a mind to a singer's range and whether it's easy to sing or difficult to sing. And Helen here hasn't written it herself. She's not keeping the notes within her range and making sure it is doable. These guys that write these compositions just write it, want all these particular notes, and then expect a singer to deliver it night after night and perfectly on pitch. And not every singer can do that. It needs a lot of talent in order to nail a song like this, especially with such dramatic jumps in pitch. And it is something I mentioned on my Julie Andrews video with the sound of music. Having this octave range just in the first verse is something that in more contemporary or popular music that you'll find in the charts, you'll only ever really get an octave jump from the verse to then the chorus. You'll never have an octave in that first line of a first verse or just in the first verse in isolation. The other thing Helen had in her voice was that tonal consistency throughout her range and such clarity throughout her range as well. We're gonna be listening to a part of the song that includes the high note of the song. It's a C-sharp five. Not that you'd notice because Helen hits the notes with such consistency and such clarity. Listen to her head voice in this particular phrase and also just take in how easy she makes it look considering it is the high note of the song. But the phrase is, I never thought I'd come to this. Let's have a listen. And there we have it. It is so consistent, that whole vocal phrase, that you're not ever thinking about Helen straining to hit the high note of the song. It just flows and you can really hear the accuracy in pitch. Obviously, no auto-tune here. We're talking about the early 70s, but this is how they did it back then, hitting these notes right between the eyes. But it's all about that consistency of tone because so many singers, when they get to a high note of the song, They'll strain, they'll push a little bit more, and the voice might start to sound a bit raspy. You won't get that consistency. Whereas the people that do write these songs want a voice that's gonna sound the same from their lowest note to their highest note, and Helen was one of those rare cases that had the ability to do that. I've got the guitar out just to show you guys the vocal gymnastics going on here from a pitch perspective because melody-wise in the verse, and this is literally the first line of the song, we've got And we jump up to a C5. Just for reference, the C sharp five is the highest note of the whole composition vocally. So, you're only one note off in the first verse, the first line of the song. Anyway, considering the previous note before this C5 was a D sharp four, the amount of notes difference between those two, I'll play through all of them. And there you have it. So when I mentioned about composers just writing notes and expecting you to do it, the range that Helen covers there is crazy, but also take into consideration 
her vocal tone and how difficult she makes it look. This is the thing that people might think this song is easy to sing because Helen makes it look really easy, but there is such a dramatic difference between those two notes. And you might have some singers that might go, I don't know how to love it. And they have to force out that C5 because it is so high. And this is where you get a real appreciation of Helen's ability. Again, I've cued the video to a very particular point because I want to point out something about Helen's breathing and her diaphragmatic breath that she's taking, the support that she's got in her voice in order to hit these notes with such clarity and be able to sometimes put air into the sound if she wants to as well, because she is taking a breath from her diaphragm. She's pushing it way down there and you'll get to see the diaphragmatic breath from the side on shot that we get. The first one, you'll see the top of what would be her stomach, if you're looking at the abs, is going in and the bottom part of her stomach just pushes out because when you're singing with correct technique, that's what happens. It's almost like your belly expands. You don't see the chest and the lungs go <gasps> and go up and out. It's all in the lower half. So look out for this. Helen, even though she's making it look really easy vocally, you won't notice this and you rarely get to see this, but because she has a very slender figure and has a tight dress on, it means that you can see her stomach moving and not her chest moving when she's breathing, which is essential for great singing. So let's have a little look at this and just look at that stomach. Should I bring him down? Should I scream and shout? Should I speak of love? Let my feelings out. I never thought of that. And there we have it. So you can see that part of her dress just move up and down, but it's not all in this area. It's in the stomach, but down where the diaphragm is. So having all of that support, it means that when she breathes in, and then delivers a vocal, she's then applying pressure. So to try and give a practical example of what's going on here, when Helen breathes in, she's now got all of that support in place where she can lean on her diaphragm, push down. And to give an example of that, if you imagine getting punched in the stomach and you'd go like that, you would stop the air coming out with your vocal cords and you can feel the pressure underneath your vocal cords and it's something that you can lean on and if you tense your stomach after breathing in and breathing in from your diaphragm that feeling is what you get when you're singing so if I was singing the same phrase that Helen just did and breathed in from my chest and I sang should I bring him down should I scream and shout you can hear that there's a lot of air in there. It's not particularly connected and it's not a strong sound. Whereas if I breathed in from my diaphragm and leant on it to get that uh, kind of sensation, then we get, should I bring him down? Should I scream and shout? And you can start to hear the power and the extra emphasis that I can put on my words, on the vocal, on my diaphragm, that extra pressure, the clarity of the vocal as well. As I was hitting a higher note, it didn't get more airy, it got more connected because of pushing down on the diaphragm more. And that is all to do with the breath that we can see Helen taking here. But it was just a really interesting thing to see in the video from that side on shot because you get to see that breath that Helen's taking. And with all of the top singers, you'll never see a great deal of shoulder movement and chest movement when they're breathing in and breathing out because it's all below that. It's the lower end of their abs. That's where the breath is actually being emphasized and held, so then they're pushing on that diaphragm. It's almost like doing a sit-up. When you feel your muscles contract, that is the feeling of pushing down on your diaphragm. In this video, you can see that Helen, when she's singing, it looks like the top of her stomach is just coming out ever so slightly. And if you are sitting now watching this and you've got a relaxed stomach and then you tense your stomach as if you're doing a sit-up, 
it's more than likely your muscles are going to come out because they're tensing, there's pressure there. And that's exactly what we can see with Helen here. Because she has a slight figure, it means that it's even more noticeable. Again, this is one of those videos that you could go through with a fine tooth comb because there is so much in here. I just have cued the video to another point to listen to this vocal phrase. If he said he loved me. Listen to the difference in expression and vocal technique Helen has with this particular phrase because the love me, you can hear all of the air flowing through her vocal cords whereas previously she's been really connected so it means that she's got that ability to give you so many different forms of expression with her voice but also just with the technique of having that diaphragmatic breath and leaning on the diaphragm if she wants to, to get that really connected sound, but then also just relax a little bit and allow more air through the vocal folds in order to get this difference in expression. But again, so easily done seemingly by Helen, it's not easy to do at all, but she's so relaxed when she's performing it and delivering it that at no point are you thinking about vocal technique. You're just accepting this vocal performance and enjoying it for what it is. But I do want to get into Helen's history and career. She came from a showbiz family. Her mum was known in Australia very much so. She was on TV in various shows over there. Her dad was a writer and producer, actor as well. And she started performing at the age of four because her parents always told her that she would be a star. And it's something that Helen didn't really want in the beginning. And she would rebel against this and want to be a housewife and not be a star at all. When she was 12 years of age, she went to live with her aunt because she's performing with her mum and dad. They were doing nationwide tours and they were very much together in a professional capacity and constantly working and there were arguments. So Helen went to live with her aunt and it's where she said she gained her stability, her sense of morality and her strength. So this rebellious streak that Helen had culminated in her getting married at the age of 20 and having a kid at that age as well. Unfortunately, divorce followed very soon after that. And she realized now she had to make some money. She was a single mother and she started to really focus on singing. She performed on radio and on TV and on Bandstand, which was a TV show that was a talent show. The first prize for that, which she won, was a trip to New York in order to record with Mercury Records. And when she got there, unfortunately, she'd been told as part of the competition that she'd be recording a single, whereas they told her that it was only an audition that she'd won. And unfortunately, her audition wasn't successful. So she had $200 and her return ticket home to Australia. But she thought that she would stay in New York with her three-year-old and try and pursue a singing career. So Helen started performing in the USA, but unfortunately she didn't have a work permit. So she would regularly travel to Canada, where as a citizen of a Commonwealth country, it meant that she could perform there and earn money from it because she didn't need a work permit there. When she was back in the USA at a party that she was hosting, she met Jeff Wald and they were married within three days of meeting. So it meant that now Helen could perform in the USA and earn money from it. Jeff would also become her manager and they still didn't have a lot of money at this point. Jeff then got a job as the talent coordinator at a nightclub called Mr. Kelly's, which did open a few doors because it meant now Helen could get booked at Mr. Kelly's and start to perform regularly there and other venues in the USA. Helen started to get attention from her performances at Mr. Kelly's, but also other local lounges. And it was in 1968 that she signed to Fontana Records. And this was part of Mercury Records at the time, the record label that she had already auditioned for and failed. So they recorded One Way Ticket. And that didn't do really well in the USA, but it did get to number 83 in the charts in her homeland, Australia. And it was her first ever chart appearance. 
After this, they relocated to LA, and Jeff was hired and fired in the same day by Capitol Records, and I'm not sure as to why that was, but in 1969, Helen was studying at university parapsychology and philosophy, and Jeff was starting to have some success managing Deep Purple and Tiny Tim, and Helen said to him, what are you doing spending all of this time on those bands? You should be focusing on me and my career, and she said, either start focusing on me or you're out the door. So he did, and he really threw himself into it and contacted Capitol Records by phone consistently for five months, and they eventually agreed to allow Helen to cut one single. And the conditions of that were that <laughs> Jeff had to promise to not call them for a month because he was just constantly calling them. So for that one single, she recorded I Believe in Music, which was written by Mac Davis. And sadly, Mac passed away recently and I did do a video on Mac if you wanna check that out on this channel here. Also, the B-side of that single was this song, I Don't Know How To Love Him, and it got to number 13 in the charts, so it was her first big hit in the USA. And in 1972 is when she released I Am Woman, which turned into her first number one in the USA, making her the first female artist from Australia to ever get to number one in the USA, so she made history. But also that song won a Grammy, and it really hit a chord with women across the world and became a huge part of the women's movement at that time. So over the next five years, she had a multitude of top 40 hits. In 1974, she received her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. She was headlining in Las Vegas, having artists like Barry Manilow opening the show for her. Also, she helped one of her good friends, Olivia Newton-John, move over to the USA and it was at a party that Helen was hosting that she met Alan Carr, and Alan just really liked Olivia, and Alan was making a movie at the time, if you don't know who he was, he was a film producer, and the movie was Grease that he was working on, looking for a female lead role in that, and it just so happened that he met Olivia at Helen's party, and that's how that all got started. She had huge success throughout the 70s, including eight number ones on the easy listening charts, in 1983, she recorded her final album with MCA Records, and that was called Imagination. In 1990, she released Feel So Young, and that was on her own record label that she'd set up at that point. In 1997, she released Center Stage, and in the year 2000, she released The Best Christmas Ever, which was obviously a Christmas album. In 2002 is when she did announce her retirement. In 2015, she performed a cover of All You Need Is Love, and that was for the Keep Calm and Salute the Beatles album. She appeared a lot on TV, TV as well, hosting her own TV special in the USA in 1979. She was a Golden Globe nominated actor as well, appearing on TV and film in the 1980s. She performed on Broadway as well as the West End here in London. So such a multi-skilled artist and performer and could pretty much turn her hand to anything. Sadly, Helen did pass away at the age of 78 on the 29th of September 2020. But it's great to have a look back at Helen in full flow here, right at the beginning of her career, with the song that was her first real hit, getting to number 13 in the charts. And from then on, she just went from strength to strength. But thank you guys so much for asking for this video tonight and also requesting this video for me to take a look at. Keep the suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And I'll see you guys at the next one.